Obamacare remains a major issue in the presidential campaign some six years after it was passed into law. Net spending on medicines has risen 21% since the legislation uh, became, uh, came into effect. And drug prices have continued to climb, rising 12.4% last year alone. My next guest says that the pressure on U.S. drug prices will continue to climb regardless of who wins the White House in November. Joining me right now is Glaxo Smith Klein CEO Andrew Witte. Good to see you, Andrew. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Marin. So, Love to be here. So you think just this pressure on drug makers to get the cost down is going to just be an issue regardless of who wins? Absolutely. Uh, for a couple of big reasons. One, you've got the fundamental demographics of the U.S. population. More people getting older, wanting higher quality of care. There's just going to be more demand in the system that's going to put pressure on affordability secondly the changes which have been made in the US over the last five or six years partly through the Obamacare legislation but also through changes in the market structure have led to an intense pressure between payers and suppliers on price negotiation and we're seeing ex extreme uh, examples of that in certain therapeutic areas I think that kind of thing is going to continue to play forward what's critical for a company like GSK or anybody in the research-based industries we have to deliver innovation and value for money I think what the system has to move toward and what I hope new administration will start to focus on next year and beyond is how can we simplify and make more transparent this pricing environment in the US because actually nobody really knows what any of the real prices are because there's so much negotiation between the gross to the net level. So you've got, you've got to grow and, and, and continue this upward growth of the company regardless of what's going on with this pressure on prices. I know you had big news yesterday with the rheumatoid arthritis uh, drug you have in development that passed a crucial step. But what do you do at, at GlaxoSmithKline to make sure that the growth story is in place even as you face this kind of right. pressure to make sure not to charge too much on drugs? Well, we, we We've done some very major reshaping of the group over the last two years where we've expanded our consumer health care business and our vaccine business. Those tend to be exposed to different sorts of price pressures to the ones that we're talking about here in the U.S. That's given us a much stronger element of growth from those businesses. When we talk specifically about the U.S. pharma market, it's all about innovation. So areas like the new uh, rheumatoid arthritis drug, we got great news recently on the timing on our next new respiratory product, being able to bring that forward more quickly. We've seen a rollout of the last six products we've launched in the last three years, already now accounting for 20%, a fifth of our sales, and now coming from products less than three or four years old. So for us, it's all about innovation. What I'm also very pleased about is that we've been able to launch all of our most recent products in America at lower prices than the technology we're aiming to replace. What we're trying to do is walk the talk here. It's clear that something has to happen around pricing. What we need to do is make our R&D efforts more efficient, deliver more innovation, and bring those products forward at lower prices prices than we've seen in the past. Yeah, and you've been very effective at that, and I know that's very tough to do in your industry, but this has been a priority for you. Yeah. Uh, so what, I mean, you face what every drug company faces, and that is the patent. This is the way of life where yeah. cheaper drugs will come in because of generics. So what do you do to offset expiring patents uh, where people worry that the revenue goes away? Well, again, it's about innovation from R&D, so making sure we're bringing forward uh, new products. We've had more FDA approvals in the last five years than any other company in the U.S., so innovation is important. We're exploring new areas beyond drugs, so we're looking at bioelectronic research where we're looking at potentially nano size implants to help use your nervous system instead of using drugs, so potentially using a device instead of a drug. And then we've extended our presence in consumer and vaccines, which are not exposed to the same kinds of pressures. And that's why in the first quarter, you saw the sales for the company up nearly 6% and earnings up 8%. Yeah, but some people are still saying that you can, you can really monetize and get great growth uh, if you spin out the consumer business. Is this a consideration? That's not something that the company's focused on right now. The board have taken a long-term view that the strategic shape of the group, having a strong consumer business, which gives us real footprint globally, as well as this balance to the risk you've talked about, makes a lot of sense for the, for the organization. So at this point in time, for the foreseeable future, we're focused on running the group as it stands. We think it makes a lot of sense, and as we've seen the ebbs and flows of different companies' fortunes in the last 18 months, we think this model makes more sense for the tough environment than we anticipate going forward. Let me, let me turn to uh, the the UK and, and obviously GlaxoSmithKline, one of the most important companies yeah. in the UK, largest pharma company, you've been vocal that you'd like the UK to remain in the European Union. Yeah. Why? 
Uh, we've been uh, vocal on that front for a couple of reasons. First of all, uh, the UK as a member of Europe is governed by the European Medicine Agency and actually all of the regulatory framework is essentially a European framework. Ironically, the European Medicine Agency is located in London. So it's kind of weird to think about if we're not in Europe, what on earth happens to the... It'd be a bit like having Washington DC not be part of America. What, what happens to the FDA? Right. And so that's just weird. Secondly, the idea of going through a period of prolonged uncertainty where it's not at all clear what the trade rules will be is not something we want to spend time worrying about. We would much prefer to spend our energies and we think the government should spend its energies focusing on how to make the current organization with Europe work better than to spend the next five years trying to invent some new way of operating on the world stage. We just don't think there's a reward for that uncertainty. Which is why so many people feel that we're going to see a market disruption if in fact the UK votes to leave the EU. Do you have a plan for that? I mean, what, what if they do vote to leave the EU? Well, we have, we have put in plans. We don't think there is an immediate acute negative impact for the company if there is a vote to leave the EU. We think over a more chronic or prolonged period, we think it will be more about missed opportunity and distraction. The reality is, I think if we leave the EU, it's inevitable that the country will go into a prolonged period of introspection, looking at how we re reposition ourselves in the world. Meanwhile, the rest of the world gets on with competition. Right. I think we need to be focused focused on an externally orientated perspective and focus on how to compete globally. Um, and so that's really where the risk is. I don't think it's an acute risk for us, but it's a more chronic risk for the country. Yeah, it's really a, a big story. And, and you know, we'll, we, that, that uh, vote can go any way. Yeah. The markets are trading with where the British pound is right now as if it won't happen. Right. But the, but the polling says that they, wa they want yeah. to leave. The polling uh, looks pretty tight, although I have to say the last two or three major elections or referenda in the UK, the polls have tended not to be great haven't always got it right okay. and, and things have not always gone the way of the polls but who knows yeah let me ask you before you go about some of the drugs in the pipeline I know that the HIV drug has mm. had great success mm. uh, and I know that you have started to look at the Zika virus yes. uh, what can you tell us about that well for Zika we're at very early, like everybody we're at very early stages but we have a very interesting early technology which we're developing called self uh, uh, amplifying uh, microRNA so that's a very interesting area for us to pursue as you know we were leaders in the Ebola we deployed the first candidate vaccine in Ebola we had the biggest supply of uh, flu in the pandemic crisis so we tend to be the guys who get called up there uh, what we are doing as well at the moment to try and improve the global readiness for this we've made proposals to global governments to create a permanent standing biopreparedness research organization based here in the US and that's something that I'm also hopeful will get green lighted over the next six or nine months excellent well we'll be watching certainly uh, with great interest Andrew great to see you thank you Marie. thank you so much for joining us Andrew Whitty the CEO of GSK